Opponent. It may well be that it is an evil for the soul to act as an agent and an experiencer, but not so is the power itself for the action and the experience, so that liberation may come when the expression of the power in the form of action is stopped while the latency remains. Vedantin. That too is wrong. For so long as the potentiality remains, the manifestation of the power becomes irresistible. Opponent. In that case, it may well be that the power by itself cannot accomplish anything without the aid of other causes, so that even when that power abides potentially alone, it cannot run into evil. Vedantin. That also is wrong, since the other causes, like adrishta, unseen potentiality of past action, as also the potential results, ever remain associated with the soul through their association with the latency of agentship and experience. Hence, there can be no hope of liberation so long as a soul persists to be by nature an agent and experiencer, when at the same time that its identity with Brahman, realizable through knowledge, does not exist. And the Upanishad denies that there can be any other path of liberation except knowledge. There is no other path to reach the goal. Shvetashvatar Upanishad 3.8 Opponent Even if the soul be non-different from the Supreme Brahman, this will only result in the annulment of all human dealings, including the scriptural instruction. For then there can be no application of the means of knowledge like perception, etc., Vedanta. Not so, for that is possible before enlightenment, like the behavior in a dream before awakening. The scripture also speaks of the use of perception, etc., in the case of the unenlightened man, in the text, because when there is duality, as it were, then one sees something. Briharanyaka 2, 4, 14 and 4, 5, 15. And then it shows the absence of this in the case of an enlightened man. But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one see and through what? Ibidam, etc. Thus, since the notion of Brahman as a goal to be reached and other such ideas are eliminated for one who has realized the supreme Brahman, any movement cannot be asserted in his case in any way. Opponent. Where, then, can the texts about movement find proper scope? Vedantin. The answer is that their scope is limited within the meditations based on attributes. Thus it is that the pursuit of a path is sometimes spoken of in connection with the meditation on the five fires, and sometimes with the meditation on the couch of Brahman or on Vaishvanara. Even where a movement is spoken of in connection with Brahman, as in Prana, literally vital force, is Brahman. Bliss is Brahman. Space is Brahman. Chandogya 4.10.4 And then the tiny lotus of the heart that exists as a place in this city that the body is. Chandogya 8.11 There also a movement is possible, because what is meditated on there is but the qualified Brahman itself, possessed of the attributes of being the ordainer of the results of works, the possessor of all true desires, and so on. But nowhere is any movement indicated in connection with the Supreme Brahman in the same way as it is denied in His Organs Do Not Depart, Brihadaranyaka 446. Since even in passages like The Knower of Brahman Attains the Highest, Taitariya Panishad 211, where the root meaning of attainment implies movement, there is no possibility of reaching anywhere according to the reasons already adduced. Therefore, it is the very realization of one's own nature that is spoken of as this attainment, 
from the standpoint of erasing out this universe of name and form superimposed through ignorance. And it is to be understood as having been said in the same sense as having been Brahman, he attains Brahman. Brihadaranyaka 446 and similar texts. Again, even if movement has to be explained in connection with the Supreme Brahman, it must be held to have been asserted either by way of inducing the aspirant or for meditation. Now, no inducement can be generated by speaking of movement to one who has realized Brahman, since that is already an accomplished fact for him by his having become established in his own self, which consummation is brought about by the knowledge of Brahma, and which is directly, and not immediately, self-evident to himself. Moreover, it does not stand to reason that the realization of Brahman, which is not productive of any result, but merely presents liberation as an ever-accomplished fact, should depend in any way on the reflection about a course to be followed. Accordingly, movement is possible only in relation to the inferior Brahma. That being so, it is only through a failure to distinguish between the superior Brahman and inferior Brahman that the texts about traveling that refer to the inferior Brahman are ascribed to the superior Brahman. Namaste. So the poor opponent, you know, he just doesn't get it. <laughs> he keeps arguing, trying to prove his crazy theory that if you just stop doing stuff, then you get liberated. Huh? It's, it's kind of Zen, right? Don't just do something. Sit there. <laughs> and then liberation comes like the grass grows in the spring, right? No, come on. You have to know the difference between the superior Brahman, where there's no change or movement, and the inferior Brahman, which is all different qualities and changes and movements and all that stuff. Huh? If you know this distinction, then you can easily understand the correct philosophy. Because even though the Upanishads mention various meditations on Brahman as prana, as bliss, as space, as consciousness, and so on, and then the Puranas also mention meditation on various deity forms, in that case only, some movement after death is predicated. Why? Because one is no longer fit. One is no longer qualified to live in the earthly realms. Huh? One becomes beyond human intelligence. And this means that he has to leave this human platform and go to the world of Brahman. If one realizes the inferior Brahman, the qualitative Brahman, Saguna Brahman, that means there are qualities, there are personalities, there are activities involved, relationships, and so on. But if one realizes the superior Brahman, without qualities, without action, without personality, or any of those things, then there's no movement, there's no path. After death, one simply dissolves into Brahman. So this is the ultimate goal, or this is the ultimate state. All these words are wrong. <laughs> because when it comes to Brahman, there is no goal, there is no state, there is no movement, there is no change or transformation or acquisition or any of those things, one simply disappears. I saw this happen with my sannyas guru in Tiruvannamalai. When he passed away, he was just gone. He didn't leave a trace or a track behind. Because I, I have this mystic power that if I'm close to someone, if I have an energetic connection with someone, 
when they leave the body, I can trace them. I can see where they went. Huh? But in this case, there was nothing. I had to sit there by his body <laughs> and meditate for like four hours to finally get high enough to realize where he went. Well, he didn't go anywhere. He just turned into pure light. And he was gone. Poof. So this is the state, or this is the destination. See, our, our language is so poor because we don't have a way of expressing the absolute knowledge. All of our verbs and all of our uh, words of action don't apply in the case of Brahman realization, the superior Brahman realization. And, and this leads to a great difficulty in communicating and understanding things on the absolute platform. Practically speaking, one has to realize it, you know? One has to realize it for oneself, and then words are unnecessary. <laughs> Besides, they don't really express the position. Excuse me, I have to wake up. It's three o'clock in the morning. Green tea and ashwagandha. Highly recommended. So the opponent is a person who uh, has a fixed idea they have some theory, and unfortunately their theory is wrong because it doesn't discriminate between the inferior and superior Brahman. The Brahman with qualities and without qualities. Now, see, here again, our language tricks us. It trips us up because we're used to thinking of something with qualities as being superior to something without qualities. See, so is the idea of possession again. But in the case of Brahman, this is reversed. The Brahman without qualities is superior. <laughs> so this is counterintuitive. And a lot of this Brahma Vidya is highly counterintuitive because we don't really understand that state. Here we go again. State, which implies change, which implies movement, and that doesn't apply in this case. I had a really funny dream last night, well, that tonight, <laughs> just before I woke up. You know, my background is that I was a professional musician for quite some time. That was my college degree, and that was my first job experience. Well, I left the organized music business and I moved to California during the summer of love, 1967. And I became, you know, I was in a rock band and a jazz band and like that. And musicians have to, you know, hustle a little bit to, uh, to be able to make it, to be able to survive, right? So I had this dream <laughs> going back to those days and I was trading and buying and selling, uh, you know, some herbal products uh, with my friends. <laughs> and they were saying, you know, Dave, you're the only dude in town who doesn't cheat. You know, you always give righteous ounces and you're, and you're like, you know, you never burn anybody, you know. And what's up with that? And I had to explain, well... See, when you don't have an ego, there is no such thing as like greed or the cheating propensity or, you know, a desire or like that. I have to make those things up. I have to, I have to synthesize or simulate those things to understand how other people are acting. I was explaining to them. 
<laughs> and this is really the case. When you are realized, the antics of the unrealized human beings are like almost incomprehensible. For me, it's hard to remember. It's hard to go back and remember what it was like, you know, and, and to try to simulate that to predict or understand how unrealized people see things and how they're acting. So, you see, this is the, the thing about uh, Brahman realization. If you realize that you, you lose your ego, you lose your uh, limited sense of being, limited to one body or limited to a mind or, you know, limited to words, names and forms, and you become one with the all, everything is you. Huh? So there's no sense of egotism or there's no cheating propensity or there's no desire to exploit or, you know, uh, enjoy others like possessions or something. Uh, it's simply being in tune with everything, I think, is, as a musician, <laughs> is the best way to explain it. You feel in tune. You feel simpatico. As, as Spanish people call it, that you, you dig where they're at, you know, <laughs> and you feel an, an identification with them, sympathy for them. So there's no cheating. See, if everybody had this kind of realization, this world would be paradise. This world would be very beautiful. But, you know, that's not the way it is. So, when one becomes realized, even in the inferior Brahman, then after death, he goes to a world which is suitable for his existence. And that's the world of Brahman. And that will be described in the next pada, the fourth pada. We have only one more Adhikarana to go after this one. And then we're going to get into the fourth pada, which is the most wonderful, <laughs> the most important, actually, in the whole Brahma Sutra. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.